Father, there are times in our lives as Christians that we get to demonstrate the things that we say that we believe, the things that the Word of God teaches. And uh, Lord, how I pray that you will help us to trust you no matter what we go through in life, no matter what uh, the difficulty may be, no matter what the challenge may be, that we'll learn to trust you. God, we, you're the same God on the mountaintop. You're the same one in the valley. For that, we're grateful. I pray that you're blessed today. I certainly pray for uh, Steve and Jill and, and the boys that you'll help them uh, this week. And uh, God, give us wisdom and discernment in what we do to be a help. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Come on, gentlemen. Boy, y'all look so distinguished. Absolutely distinguished. Yeah. Good. Anybody here today for the very first time anywhere in the building uh, by chance? To, good. Good to have you. Glad to have y'all with us today. That gentleman's got a gift for you. There is in that visitor's packet, there is a uh, visitor's card. If you don't mind, if you'll fill it out and drop it in the offering plate in just a few minutes, we'd appreciate it so much. Stand with us. We continue to sing this morning, 404 in your hymn book, if you want to use it, or we'll put the words on our screen. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
you sing it with us this morning. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Oh, Christ, the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Sing the lives. When he shall come with trumpet sound. Times our choir members have things to take care of before services start, like the nursery and such as that. And we have a seat for you. We have a seat for Tabitha. Y'all come on up, Tabitha. We have a seat for Anna. You feeling okay? Good. Anybody else that I'm missing? Anywhere? Jake, Jack, y'all just stay right there where you are. You're you're good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, girls. I appreciate it. All righty, again, we're glad to have you folk visiting with us today. We also sing uh, choruses, and uh, we, uh, we take pride, I, I mean, I do as a pastor, I take pride in that we are a very traditional church. Uh, we're not uh, contemporary, and uh, I'm not accusing anybody else. If that's what they choose to do, that's certainly their business, but... Uh, you just move stuff that's in your way. Y'all just move it wherever it is and sit wherever you'd like to sit. We don't have saved seats around here. We just, yeah, good. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. Help me, choir. Here we go. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. I will sing. that we can serve him is simply because of the mercies of the Lord. Yeah. God gives us mercy to serve him. God gives us grace to serve him. I don't know of two, uh, two better reasons to serve him. I will serve thee because I love thee. But you know, the Bible says that he loved us first. Yeah. There wasn't nothing about me to be lovable. I, I can promise you that. But he loved me in spite of who I was. He said, I'll take you as you are and make you what I ought to be. And uh, I never have got over that. I'll pray that I never do, okay? Here we go. I will serve thee because I Oh 
hands, shake hands. Make people feel welcome today. Stand with us one last time, if you would. We'll let our choir be seated. Our ushers come in to take today's offering. Oh, how I love Jesus. Sing it with us this morning. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its word. It sounds like music. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of His precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. sing the last. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, Because he first 
loved me. Good morning, guys. How are you? Good. Thank you for your help. Is this your first time to help? You've done this before. You're an old hat. It's good. Thank you for your help. Okay. Ready to pray? Carolyn, you sure? I can't believe that you're old enough to do this. Where's your mama at? Is she in? What? Okay. You ready to pray? Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you for how real you are to us at all times. We don't take any of that for granted. Thank you for the faithfulness of our people and their giving. In Christ's name, amen. Can I? Amen. Thank you, fellas. Many of us have watched maybe a TV program or we've actually been to a court of law. And um, although what you see on TV typically doesn't represent real life, but what most attorneys are trying to do in a court of law is they're trying to, uh, especially for someone who's, who's been called as a character witness for maybe the person who's on trial, is they'll try to poke holes in that person's um, testimony. They'll try to find things from the defendant's past that would help support maybe what they were on trial for. That maybe their character wasn't quite as good as, as uh, people thought it was. And oftentimes people are convicted in a, in a court of law because of some of the things that have happened in their past. And the jury views that as, well, if they did it in the past, they might have done it today. Even though our justice system is supposed to be based on facts. Okay, but that's what attorneys in a lot of cases try to do. And I thought about this. I thought about the song that the girls are going to sing today. You know, if Jesus were on trial, you never you couldn't ever convict him of not being what he said he was going to be. You never could convict him of not ever being faithful, of not always being of the almighty God. He's not guilty of any of those. There never has been a time. When the Lord Jesus didn't, and, and didn't fulfill what he said he was going to fulfill. And there's coming a day when that track record is going to come home for all of us. Because the Bible says that one day he's coming back here to take all of us to a place called glory. Those who know him as their savior. You listen as the girls sing this song. Are you weary from the battle you're fighting? And does it seem like the storm won't just break? Is there a mountain in front of you that doubt says will never move? And you wonder, will God make a way? Well, tell me a time He's not been faithful. Tell me a morning his mercies weren't new. Tell me a moment he wasn't able to carry you through. Tell me a day he was less than almighty. When he could not hold back the tide Child, when you look back You're gonna find There was never a time So be strong in the Lord and remember to take hold of faith and stand firm. Oh, you can be confident the Lord keeps his promises. If you doubt it, just read through his word and tell me a time he's not been faithful. Tell me a moment his mercies aren't new. Tell 
me a moment he was too able to carry you through tell me a day he was less than almighty when he could not roll back the tide child when you look back you're gonna find there was never a time oh he can work miracles do the impossible if you don't believe it just go on and try he's not been faithful and tell me a morning his mercies weren't new tell me a moment he wasn't able to carry you through carry you through to tell me a day he was less than almighty when he could not roll back the tide child when you look back you're gonna find there was never a day he was less than almighty when he could not roll back the tide child when you look back you're gonna find there was never a time oh there was never a time there was never a time if i were to ask you to turn in your Bible to the oldest book in the Bible. Most of y'all would go to the book of Genesis, but in actuality, the book of Genesis is not really the oldest book in the Bible, but the book of Job is. You'll go to the book of Job. Oftentimes, new Christians, instead of calling it the book of Job, they call it the book of Job, but it's the book of Job. Just before the book of Psalms, you'll go there. Just a couple of things before I get into this, facts about Job and the book. You'll see that in chapter number one, actually in verse number one, Job was very godly in character. He wasn't sinless, but he was a true believer, and he lived his life inconsistent of what he said that he believed. The word blameless is a genuine uh, meaning Job was the same on the inside as it was on the outside. That's what the word perfect there means. It means to be blameless, but it doesn't mean to be without sin. But the Bible also says that Job was very prosperous, that that, uh, that does away with what we know in our day and time is prosperity preaching preachers. There's a lot of preachers nowadays that are on television and other venues that talk about prosperity. If you do the right things and if you believe the right things and if you give to the right preachers, then you'll enjoy health, wealth, and all that goes along with that. <laughs> well, Job does away with that in a heartbeat. If you know anything at all about about the book of Job. Our church has had a uh, very difficult week this week in the respect of one of our young people, a 15-year-old young lady, went to heaven. And sometimes when things like that take place, there's a lot of questions that go on, a lot of questions of, you know, what God's doing. And I'm certainly not trying to stand here and tell you that I know the mind of God at all. But I do want to take just a few minutes and speak on this subject of why, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? Maybe it'll, uh, it'll help uh, some of you. And maybe in the stricter sense, we could ask the question, you know, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? 
So as I read, uh, actually I'm going to read the first chapter, the whole chapter of the book of Job, if you'll follow along. kind of gives you the setting of what's taking place in this very godly man, the man that loved the Lord with all of his heart, the man that served God as best he knew how, but we learn right off the bat that, that uh, he was going through some of the most, going through a battle that I could not fathom going through for what he, what he had to deal with. So if you'll just follow along with me. There was a man in the land of Uz. The word land there has reference to a city, okay? It was a, a city he was talking about. Uh, in the land of Uz, Uz would be a place that we know now as Northern Arabia. All of this took place in that particular area. So there was a man of the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect, meaning he, was, he wasn't without sin, but he was blameless uh, and upright and one that feared God, feared of his life not pleasing to God. And then he says, he also eschewed evil. The word eschewed there means, simply means that he turned away from evil. That when evil would come before him, he would turn away from it. When he was tempted, he had enough spirituality about him to turn away from it. Verse 2. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters, a large family, ten children. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, and 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men in the East. He was the Bill Gates of his day. You didn't measure wealth in those days by the money or the coins that you had. You measured wealth by the livestock that you owned, and he had a great deal. So it seemingly had everything in the world going for him. Verse 4. And his sons went and feasted in their house, every one his day. Now what that means is this. His sons, every day they would meet at a different son's house and they would have a meal. Normally in those days it was the, the lunch or the dinner, uh, mid, midday meal. And uh, they would go to a different house each time. That was, they were just a very close-knit family from what Scripture says. Everyone his day. And he sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. In other words, they would go to the son's house. They would get a hold of their sisters and say, We're going to eat at 1 o'clock. Y'all be here. And they would get together. Verse 5. And it was so that when the days of their feastings were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Well, what that means is simply this, that Job was enough of a godly man that he would intercede on behalf of his children. Every, uh, every morning he would get up and he would pray for his children by name. And he would intercede on their behalf by the chance that they did something that they may have forgotten about, that he would take it to God and ask God to forgive them for it. And ask God to work in their hearts and lives and such as that. In those days, the father served as the priest of the home because this was before Moses. This was before all of that was organized by God to the children of Israel. Verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now, honestly, we could spend some time there. What he's talking about, he's talking about angels. I read after one commentator, and he said this is almost like a, having a cabinet meeting, that they would get together. Now the scene changes from earth, and it goes to heaven. You say, how does all that work? I ain't got a clue. I like to stand here and tell you I can explain it all, but don't need me trying to if I don't quite understand it all. But I can picture what, what went on, that there was a time that, that Satan had access. Well, actually, if you go to the book of Revelation, you'll find that Satan still has access to God and blaming me and you for the things that we do. 
But he, he had access to God along with some fallen angels that would, uh, would go before God and such as that. Verse 7, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence cometh thou? In other words, he's having this conversation with Satan. He said, Where are you coming from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feared God and eschewed evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Does he do what he does for nothing? What's he get out of it? Surely he gets something out of it. You know, surely he does all these good stuff that he does so that he could get something from it. Verse 10, has not thou made a hedge about him? This is Satan saying to God, and you made a hedge about him, put a circle of hedge about him, about his house and about all that he hath on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. In other words, Satan is trying to call God's hand. says, if you'll just take, take your hedge down, and you just let happen to him what's going to happen to him, I guarantee you he'll curse you. Verse 12, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put forth not thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. In other words, God said, all right, let's see what he's made of. Let's find out exactly what Job's made of. You have access to him. You have access to all of his stuff. Just don't touch him physically. Verse 13, yet. And there was a day... When his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing, the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabians, that, that was part of a, 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 a robbers that, were, that went about uh, in Arabia. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I am only escaped alone to tell thee. Verse 16. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. It gets worse and worse. Verse 17. And yet while he was yet speaking, there came yet another and said, The Chaldeans, that was a nomadic type people that that went about in Arabia uh, robbing and, and, and thieving and killing people. Said the Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. In other words, little by little, Job is losing everything he's got as far as his power and his wealth, his influence. Verse 18. While yet he was speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men, and they're dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. That's a lot to say right there. And worshipped. He didn't tuck tail and run. He didn't start throwing darts towards God. Or anything along that line. He says he worshipped. Verse 21. This is what he said. Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Now, Miss Job, she didn't have the same mindset and the attitude as Job. If you look at chapter 2, verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? 
that word integrity there simply has the idea that, that Job's faith did not waver. I mean, he just lost seven sons and three daughters, but his faith, he lost everything that he had, but his faith did not waver. This is what Miss Job says. Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speaketh as one of a foolish woman speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Our Father, I pray for these few minutes. I'm confident there's not a person in this room that doesn't have their trials and their struggles and their difficulties. Maybe a lot of things that people deal with that we don't know about, but just them and you. But it's real to them. And Father, I pray that we can say something this morning that may be a help to those that listen carefully. And it's not about what I say, Lord. It's all about what you say. And God, I thank you for what you'll do if you'll help me. In Christ's name, amen and amen. You know, the truth is, it seems as though some people have a greater right to ask the question, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? And maybe you're here this morning and you've had someone that you love dearly that, that they died unexpectedly. Maybe it's someone that, that's been diagnosed with something that we don't understand. You don't understand. Uh, we, we don't have a handle on you know, if you could, you'd take their place in a heartbeat. And they have a, maybe if they're a young person, they have an entire life ahead of them to live, and you would do whatever you could. We could go on and on with these illustrations, but I think that you get my point of what I'm trying to convey. Whatever, whatever it is that might be going on in your life, you know, let me, let me maybe say it this way. I found to be true that nothing really becomes important until it becomes personal. You can sit there and you can say something like, well, God bless their hearts and what they're going through. And I understand that. I, I've been there and done that. But it's not until you've experienced whatever it is that it really become important. Until your child maybe is born with a special need. Until you get the phone call from the doctor with some sort of a diagnosis that you didn't want to hear, or maybe your child, uh, you know, is born with a mental challenge of some sort, or your sister comes down with some dreaded disease, or your life is turned upside down because of a car accident, and the list could go on and on and on. But it's important for us, I think, to understand that we live in a world of heartache, pain, and suffering, plain and simple. Now, I thank God that when, when the water is running smooth, that's, that's a blessing. And we all enjoy that. There are seasons in our life when things seem to be going real well. But we well understand that there's going to come a time when the waters begin to churn. The waters begin to change. The storm begins to blow in our life because that's just the way life is. There's no one who is not affected by the harsh realities of life and the results of sin that you and I face in our lives. And we all have asked the same question. Why? Why me? Why at this time in my life? Why this phone call? Why this issue? And truth is, it's probably one of the most difficult questions in all of theology to try to answer but I can put it this way. God is sovereign. If you don't get anything else this morning, you need to understand that God is sovereign. You say, what does sovereign mean? That means he's in control. Total, absolute control of whatever it may take place in our lives. So all that happens must at least be allowed by him, if not even designed by him, but it must be filtered through him. God allows certain things to take place in our life. And I think at the onset of this message, we've got to acknowledge that human beings are not eternal. Human beings are not infinite. They're not omniscient. They don't know everything. 
they're not impotent, uh, in, in, in the, in, omnipotent in the fact that they have uh, all power. That's just not us, but that is God. And in the book of Job, Job is a great book that deals with the issue of why God allowed bad things to happen to people. If you go back to verse number one, and, and I'm not going to take time to read it again, but you understand that Job was about as good a guy that you could come across. Job was good. He was well respected. He was a family man who loved God. He feared not pleasing the Lord with his life, yet he suffered in ways that are almost beyond belief. And Miss Job was the same way. I'm, I'm confident that uh, if some of you ladies went through what they went through, lo losing seven sons and three daughters and all of the wealth and the influence and friends, probably, when you lose your wealth, you lose friends. But when you go through all this kind of stuff, I'm pretty confident we'd all do the same thing. But God allowed Satan to do all that he wanted to do to Job except take his life. You say, well, what was Job's reaction? Go back, turn over a few pages to uh, chapter 13 for just a second. Look at verse 15. Job says this, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. Though he slay me, I'm going to trust him. You say, well, do you really believe it? He lived it. If we had time to go all the way to the end of the book, I could show it to you. If you'll also notice in chapter 1 and verse number 21. And naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't think Job understood, you know, why God allowed all the suffering. I don't believe you find anywhere in the book of Job that God explains it to him. But Job continued to trust the Lord. You know, do you suppose Job may have been written for your benefit and for my benefit that we could go to the book of Job and try to figure out what God was doing? Why do bad things happen to good people? You know, as hard as it is to acknowledge, we got to remember that there are no good people in the absolute absolute. Abs absolute sense no good people the bible says we're all sinners every single one of us it says in the in the book of ecclesiastes you can either turn to it or, or just listen ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse number 20 for there is not a just man upon the earth that does doeth good and sinneth not not one anywhere and there's other places it talks about in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners. All, all of us are boogers. Not a one of us in this room is not a booger of some sort. You may not be as bad as somebody else, but you're bad. The Bible also says in the book of 1 John, John was writing, he says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and this truth is not within us. Jesus said in the book of Luke, chapter 18, verse 19, none is good except one, and that is God. And the point being is simply this, guys. All of us feel the effects of sin one way or the other. We can try to blame it on anybody that we want to. We can blame it and try to pass the buck, but it's all because of sin. All because each and every one of us are sinners. Sometimes it might be our own personal sin, our own personal choices that we make. Sometimes we're impacted by the sins of other people out of our control. But the root of the whole thing is the fact that it is still sin. We live in a fallen world. We experience effects of fallen man. We experience the effects of sin in our lives in different ways. One of the effects of the fall in all of our lives is the injustices and seemingly senseless suffering that good people go through. Just doesn't seem fair. Just doesn't seem right. I could take a few minutes this morning and I could walk my way around this sanctuary and I could call names of people that it, they just, it doesn't seem fair in their life to go through what you're going through just doesn't seem right. 
And I think most of y'all would agree with me. But the truth is, you got to back it up. Somebody may not be as bad as somebody else, but we're all bad. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. Now, there will come a day that, that uh, there'll be no more sin. We can thank God for that, but that day hasn't arrived yet. One of the effects of the fall of, in all of our lives, I think, is the injustice and seemingly senseless suffering that so many people go through. What I want to do for, in just a few, for just a few minutes, let me give you four things, I think, to consider when wondering why bad things happen to good people. Four simple thoughts to consider. Number one, and they're not long, I promise you. Bad things may happen to good people in this world, but this world is not the end. It's important. Let that sink in. Bad things happen to good people in this world, but this world is not the end. We got a little saying around here, the best is yet to come, and it is in the life of a believer. If you go to the book, uh, keep your finger in Job, but go back to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Look, if you would, for just a second at just uh, two or three verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Paul writes to these believers at Corinth, and he says this, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceedingly and eternal weight of glory. That word worketh means produces. It creates. We go through these times, these seasons in our lives, that what we go through, it creates the struggle we face, but the struggles that we face can be for God's glory. Verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We're going to go through things. I don't care who we are. We're going to face these times and these seasons in our lives. But as a born-again believer, we can know and rest assured that they're only temporary. My wife, wife and I were walking the other day, and uh, she and I walked. And uh, as we were walking, I was trying to catch up with her the best I could. That's the fastest walking woman I've ever seen in my life. But I was trying to catch up with her, and uh, I, 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 she was trying to, you know, we, we have some deep thoughts uh, well, it's deep on her part, but anyhow, uh, she said, uh, she said, you know how old we're going to be in 15 years? And I thought to myself, why would you say that? How old we're going to be in 15 years? I said, I said, yeah, 91. She said, you realize how fast the last 15 years have gone? And then I wanted to say to her, I didn't because I'm afraid to. I said, you know, God's never give you the gift of encouragement. <laughs> you understand that, don't you? She said, we'll be 90 and 91 years old. I said, I know. I said, I'll be in heaven. You find you a new man and you do whatever you want to do. I don't care. <laughs> Doesn't matter. But I'm saying that for this reason. You and I, life is so fast. I mean, it's just... Uh, Kelly, I can't, I can't imagine. I remember the first time I visited your house. I knocked on Kelly's door. That she had visited the church, and I followed up, went over, and knocked on her door. And as soon as she opened the door, out came Jake and Jack. Honestly, before God, I mean, rolling down the steps, rolling out in the yard fighting, carrying on, and I thought to myself, maybe, maybe I shouldn't have visited, you know. <laughs> maybe they need to find another church. It might be a good idea. But here they sit over there. Stand up, Jake and Jack, for just a minute. I mean, they were rolling out in the yard, and there they are, you know. Now you can sit down, okay? 
But I mean, that's how fast life can be. You're going to sit there and think, oh, I got a lot of living to do. No, it's going to be gone in a heartbeat. So whatever it is that you and I go through in life, whatever the struggle may be, whatever the battle may be, times are going to pass on by. And the Bible says in that verse that we need to know that what we're doing is for God's glory. I, I read this little story. There was a famous French painter. This French painter suffered from rheumatoid arthritis. His hands were so uh, infected with this rheumatoid arthritis that he could barely hold the brush, his painting brush, in the end of his hand, fingers. And he had a friend that would come over to his house and, and spend time with him. And this friend was looking at him painting on this canvas. And his friend looked at him and said, why do you suffer so? He said, you're standing there painting, and, and I can see by the grimace on your face how your fingers hurt and such as that. And, and the, the, the famous artist turned to him and looked at him and said this. He said, the pain passes, but the beauty remains. And that's where it is in our lives, guys. Our pain may, may be for, with us for a while, but it passes. But the beauty remains. The glory for God remains whatever it is we choose to do for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that's one of the things that, that Paul was trying to convey when he was talking to the people at Corinth. In the Christian life, we must look it through the eyes of Christ and eternity, not the temporary things. So, number one, bad things happen to good people in this world, but this world is not the end. Number two, Bad things do happen to good people, but God uses bad things for his ultimate and lasting glory. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, was a verse that we looked at last week. And Paul says in Romans, and we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them are called according to his purpose. All things. We know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them are called according to his purpose. Doesn't make any difference what it is that we may face in life. All things work together for the good. There was a, there was a young man in the Old Testament. He was the favorite son of Jacob. His name was Joseph. Joseph uh, was loved by God. Joseph had been promised by God that that he would, uh, that God would take care of him and all that he went through if he would just learn to obey the word of God. Joseph had been betrayed by his brothers. His brothers were jealous. They had thrown him in a cistern and the Midianites had come along and he'd sold them to them, sold into slavery. He was bought by a fellow by the name of Sir Potiphar. He was lied about by his master's wife that said that he was trying to seduce her but was a lie and was thrown in prison. Spent 13 years in prison. And all this was in the plan of God. And after all that took place, his brothers came to him. And of course, we know the story of how Joseph took care of his brothers. But they were fearful that when Joseph's dad died that he was going to get even with them. Listen to what the Word of God has to say. And his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am in this place of God. I have been put here for a reason. God put me where I am for a purpose. He goes on to say, And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am in this place of God. But as for you, you thought it evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day to save much people alive. Now, therefore, fear not. I will nourish you and your little ones and be comforted them and speak kindly unto them. In other words, others may have meant it for bad, but God meant it for good. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know why you're going through what you're going through. But if you're a child of God, God's in control of what you're going through. It doesn't make any difference 
what it may be. Number three, bad things happen to good people, but those bad things equip believers for the deeper ministry. There's a reason that God allows us to go through what we go through. And I, I don't have the explanation for each and every one of you. If you'll turn in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 for just a minute. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, begin with verse number 3. You know, what Paul is saying to these believers at Corinth, he's writing to those people that's going through a, a real struggle, but those battle scars can be better help as you go through the battle. In other words... When, and I'm, I don't mean to chase this rabbit, but when my wife and I, I when our son died uh, at 17 years old, I remember uh, she and I talking about that God's going to use this for his glory. Now, at the same time, let me, let me back up a step. I can also remember making a choice of becoming bitter or better. And I think any time in situations like that you give up a child or husband or wife or whatever it may be, there's a choice you make. You're either going to get bitter or better. So, but God has used that these all these years for his glory and for his praise. I can't say to this day that I like it. I will not say to this day I appreciate it. But I can say to this day I trust him. I believe him. I don't understand him. I didn't like it, still don't. But that's immaterial. I don't have to understand it. He said, you don't have to understand. If I could understand God, he wouldn't be much. But I can trust him. And you can too. No matter what it is that you may go through, no matter what you have to deal with in your life, you can trust him in the midst of it. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3, blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. That word comfort there is the Greek word paraclete is the same word where we get the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in Scripture is the one who steps up alongside of us to encourage us and be there with us. He's our comforter. And that's exactly what Paul is saying there. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse 4. Who comforteth us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the suffering of Christ abounded in us, so our consolation, that's a word which means comfort, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. You're not going to be able to comfort others as you could if you've not been where they are. And God allows those things in our time. And the last point, bad things happen to good people, and the worst thing happened to the best person. You say, what do you mean by that? Turn your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 2 if you want to follow along. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. For what glory is it when you be buffeted for your faults? You shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were you called because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile, that means deceit, found in his mouth. There was nobody who suffered as Christ suffered who did not deserve to suffer. But he suffered nonetheless. Christ was the only true righteous person, yet he suffered more than any of us could ever imagine. The Bible declares clearly 
But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8. Despite all of the sinful nature of people in this world, God still loves us. You you can't be so bad that God won't love you. You can't have done so wicked that God won't love you. God loves us unconditionally. Christ loved enough to take the penalty for our sins. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, if we're willing to receive Christ as Savior, He's willing to receive each and every one of us. Oftentimes, bad things happen to us just simply cannot be explained or understood. And sometimes God doesn't make a lot of sense. But I believe instead of blaming and doubting God, I've learned to trust Him and to believe Him. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. He doesn't say at certain times. He says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, no matter what the situation, no matter what the circumstance may be. I close with this last verse, and I'm through. James chapter 1 and verse 5 says this. If any of you lack wisdom, wisdom about what? Why you're going through what you're going through. Wisdom of why that takes place in your, in your life. Wisdom of why God's allowing bad things happen to you. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and unabradeth not. That means he'll explain it to you. And it shall be given him. We can ask God why. And God will give you the best understanding that you need to get you through where you are. I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I'd like to close this message out with some, something that people can relate with. And I thought about this as I was walking from my office towards the sanctuary this morning. I'm not a cook at our house. My wife cooks everything. But she did teach me one, one time how to make one thing. I can make a cake. It is a uh, carrot cake. It's good, real good. That's where amen goes. <laughs> yeah. It's carrot cake, and it really is good, you know. And uh, that's, but that's the only thing that I that I make. But I know with that carrot cake, m- my wife will tape up the recipe on our kitchen cabinet. And she'll look at me and she'll say, follow that. And I do. So you have to, she's got got a real nice uh, kitchen aid mixer. Red, pretty thing. And and I'll get all the stuff together. I'll get the, you know, the flour and the the vanilla and and all the stuff that goes in it. And, uh, and I'll put it in that mixer, and I'll turn that sucker on, and i stand there and watch it, you know, woo, woo. Now, when I first started, my favorite part is the icing. You know, the cake's okay, but I like the icing because I lick the spoon and the beaters and everything else. Now, y'all, none of y'all will ever eat my cake again. I lick them after I've used them. Don't worry about that, Okay. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's, it's okay. <laughs> I guess I ought to clarify that. Sure Anyhow, I like that icing. You put that. It's got a stick of butter. It's got uh, 16 ounces of what? Powdered, Powdered sugar, cream, cream cheese, vanilla. vanilla, and nuts. Straight from heaven. Yeah. Okay? And I put all that in there. When you look in there, you put it in there. You put the flour and the cream cheese and the butter and the the nuts and stuff. You look down in there and you say, ugh, until it starts mixing up. And I'll turn that thing. It's got several speeds on it. And I'll turn it up. And the more, you know, the smoother it gets, the faster I get with it. 
And before, right before I get through with it, I've got that mixer going full speed. Whom, whom, whom. You know, it's the one that don't sling stuff everywhere. But it mixes it real good. It's so smooth, silky smooth and such as that. But it wasn't like that when I started. It had to be put in the circumstance, mixed up. Here's my point. God is the mixer in your life. The circumstances that we go through is the butter and the flour and all that stuff. But God will mix it up. And when it comes out, make sure it's a good cake. Trust God no matter what you're going through. But you've got to know him first. You can't just say, well, you know, God's God. I'll, 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 if I need him, I'll give a call. No, it don't work that way. He's either your father or he's not. He's not a genie in a jar that you just say, well, when I need you, I'll call you. It don't work that way. He's either your, your Savior, your Lord, or he's not, one or the other. You say, well, how, how do I know? You see yourself as a sinner in need of a Savior. You turn from your sin. That's called repentance. Turn from your sin and turn to Jesus. You don't turn to the church you don't turn to good works. You don't turn to Baptist, baptism. or You turn from your sin and to Jesus Christ and Christ only. And believe in him and trust him and he'll save you. Oh, there's got to be more to it than that. That's the reason it's called a gift. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And once you know Christ is Savior, is a guarantee that what goes on in your life is going to be a mixer. Because that's the only way God can get the glory from your life and my life is we go through the mixer. But he gets the glory. Father, we thank you for your love and for your grace and for your goodness and for your faithfulness. And Lord, it would be foolish for me to stand here and try to say that I understand all this I don't understand it all but I believe it I believe the word of God I trust in it with all my heart and Lord my prayer this morning is if there be an individual in this room it doesn't matter to me Lord it doesn't matter to you if they're a church member membership never got anybody to heaven never will doesn't matter if they've been baptized that's immaterial God, they just need to see themselves as a sinner in need of a Savior. And they've never publicly stepped out and said, I need Jesus Christ as my Savior. And maybe they'd be willing to do that. Maybe right where they sit or stand in just a minute, they would say something like this, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I'm asking you as best I know how to forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and life and be my Savior. I'm trusting you and you only to save me. And then, Lord, I pray for those in the midst of their storm. They're in the midst of something they never thought they'd be at or go through. Lord, may you this morning minister to their hurt. and Let them know, Lord, that you are the mixer. You are the one in control. And the final product is going to be for your glory. But you'll comfort us along the way through other believers and through your word. For that, we're grateful. We'll thank you for what you'll do. In Christ's name, amen and amen. Let's stand.